Thank you, Joyce and Drew and Marcy. That was just beautiful. Good morning, and welcome to our worship service for May the 2nd, 2021. Um, we welcome Steve Holloway, our guest pastor, who's been with us uh, for these many months, and we've enjoyed and appreciated him being with us all this time. Please join me if you are able to stand in the call to worship. Come to worship God, whose love was revealed in Jesus. Let all the ends of the earth turn to our God. We will worship the Almighty and sing praises. We will proclaim good news to others. Beloved, we are called to love as God loves us. We are to love one another as sisters and brothers. Everyone that loves is born of God and knows God. We seek to let God's love be perfected in us. Remember that you have been baptized. God claims you and has high expectations of you. Christ is the vine. We are the branches. We will bear fruit when we abide in the vine. Please join in the singing of Hymn of Praise in the Red Hymnal, page number 579, Shine, Jesus, Shine.
The Old Testament reading is Isaiah 56, 1 through 8, and if you're following along in the Pew Bibles, it's on page 1151. This is what the Lord says, maintain justice and do what is right, for my salvation is close at hand, and my righteousness will soon be revealed. Blessed is the one who does this, the person who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath without desecrating it, and keeps their hands from doing any evil. Let no foreigner who is bound to the Lord say, the Lord will surely exclude me from his people, and let no eunuch complain, I am only a dry tree. For this is what the Lord says, to the eunuch who keeps my Sabbaths, who choose what pleases me, and hold fast to my covenant, to them I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath, Sabbath without desecrating it, and who hold fast in my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. The sovereign Lord declares, he who gathers the exiles of Israel, I will gather still others to them besides those already gathered. Please join me in singing the hymn of thanksgiving in the red hymnal, page 587, Jesus Shall Reign. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and mercy that you have shown to us. We thank you that you show that love and mercy to all the peoples of the earth and that you long to see your glory to shine among the nations. Lord, we thank you for the chance to come and worship you whether we're worshiping in the sanctuary or worshiping 
at home. Uh, we thank you that we can gather together with fellow believers, brothers and sisters, to share in a time of worship. Lord, we uh, look forward to the day when we will again be together in person. Uh, we look forward also to the day when uh, the new pastor will be welcomed uh, into Calvary Baptist. And uh, we pray that you'll give us uh, patience as we wait for what's going to happen. Lord, we think of the pandemic that continues to spread, and, and we thank you so much for vaccines and the progress that's being made. But we ask, Lord, that you would uh, protect us and our families, all our loved ones, that you would give people wisdom in uh, taking the most careful course they can in keeping themselves from getting sick. And we pray for all those who continue to minister, those people who serve in the, as first responders and in hospitals and in so many ways. Just bless them and give them stamina and encouragement. Lord, we pray for members of this church who are facing illness. We pray for those who are dealing with cancer and heart disease and diabetes, dementia, so many other conditions that make life difficult for them. And we pray that you would bring healing to them, that you would be very close to them, that you would strengthen the loved ones around them. Lord, uh, bless us today as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper, that whether we celebrate uh, physically together or at a distance, that we would sense that you are indeed present among us. Now, Lord, we join together in praying the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive others. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Our scripture reading from the New Testament is from the book of Acts, chapter 8, and we'll begin reading with verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. And this man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. And on his way home, he was sitting in the chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. And the spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. And then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading, Philip asked? How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And this is the passage of scripture that the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, as a lamb before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. And the eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? And then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. And as they traveled along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, here's water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. And then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. And they came up out of the water and the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. And the eunuch did not see him again, but he went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Here ends the reading. The book that we call the uh, Acts of the Apostles might better be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit because it's a story of how the Spirit drove the first believers out of their comfort zones to tell people about Jesus and how the early church became more and more inclusive as barriers fell. In the Christian calendar, we haven't even gotten to Pentecost yet, but the Eastertide lectionary still lifts up accounts of how the message of the risen Christ was spread around the, uh, the area around Judea and eventually to the whole world. And what happens to Philip is really one of the most amazing stories. The spirit whispers to Philip through a divine messenger um, and Philip is, mind you, he's a deacon in the church, right? He was chosen to help serve the bread, right? He's not a preacher. He's not an apostle. He's the deacon. But he's already been preaching to the Samaritans, who's, who most Jews despised. You know? And the Spirit tells Philip to go south to the road that runs between Jerusalem and Gaza. So you probably know where those two places are even today. And as soon as he gets there, along comes this man who is referred to as an Ethiopian eunuch. Now, there are a few things I want you to know about this official. I, lear I learned a lot studying this text this week. Uh, the first, he wasn't actually from Ethiopia because it turns out that in those days, the Greeks used the name Ethiopia for all of Africa uh, and everything except Egypt, basically. It was all Ethiopia to them. Uh, and all black people were called Ethiopians. Yeah. Now, when we hear 
this guy's job description that he was the treasurer to the Kandake, that helps us figure out his location more precisely because the country that used the title of Kandake was not Ethiopia, after all. The Kandake was the queen or the queen mother, either one. And the country that used that title was the kingdom of Meroe. And Meroe was, you probably never even heard of it. I hadn't, but it was an important center of civilization for centuries. And in fact, it was the only nation that stood up to the Romans and the empire backed away from trying to conquer them. And Murray was a city on the upper Nile. Today, you can find it in the country of Sudan. It's um, northeast of where Khartoum is now. And Murray was the capital city of Kush. So you may have heard of Kush, right? Or sometimes it was also called Nubia. So you've never heard about Nubians. So it's that area that's quite uh, it's pretty far north of the Horn of Africa and Ethiopia, where it is now. But if you go there, there are pyramids, smaller pyramids, like lots of pyramids that are grouped where they buried their great people and their kings and queens. And you can see pottery and jewelry that's been preserved. Um, and it was a very wealthy city in those days, uh, and a city that some people called, you know, the Birmingham of Africa because it was like, it's such a, a iron center. So they had a lot of iron ore and industry. So when, my point is that when Axe says that this African on the highway was in charge of the treasury, it's a big deal. He is powerful and wealthy. Now I might mention that this individual has very dark skin. Um, if, if you know any Ethiopian immigrants around here, um, you know they're relatively light-complected compared to many Africans, but in Kush, the people were, were black. I mean, with race on our minds so much these days, um, with discussions of police shootings and all like that, you might read this story with racial conflict in mind and, and think to yourself, well, see how... Isn't it amazing how Philip doesn't show any prejudice toward this black man? Uh, but actually, that would be not a correct reading of the story because there wasn't any racial prejudice in those days. I mean, the category of race hadn't actually been invented in the time of the first century. And there, more importantly, there was no linkage between Africans and slavery. Yeah. There were some slaves around, and maybe a few of them were Africans, but most slaves were, were not, and there was no connection between your race and your status, whether you were a slave or a free man. And when a Jew saw an African, he did not think to himself, oh, there goes a slave or somebody's servant. He didn't assume that the person was less cultured or educated than himself. He did not assume that the black person was powerless. None of that had happened yet. And the people in Jerusalem and throughout the Mediterranean uh, thought of black people as exotic and fascinating and attractive. In fact, if you look at representations of black people in the art from the Middle Ages and the Renaissance uh, in Europe, you know, you'll find them portrayed that way as kind of exotic and uh, kind of beautiful and fancy in their own way. Now, so before race slavery came along and white people had to rationalize that black people were subhuman, I mean, they had to, they had to say that to themselves or they couldn't have done what they did to them, right? Um, before that, Europeans and Middle Easterners as well thought that black was beautiful. By the way, Jews in those days, like Philip, did not think of themselves as white anyway. You know? So they, if you asked them, they would have said that they were light brown. And they thought that they weren't undercooked like those white Romans or something. They weren't overcooked like Africans. They were just right, you know. 
but here comes this rich black person in a chariot. And because he's reading, you can bet he is not actually in one of those two-wheel convertibles that we think of as chariots. Usually, how would he hold a scroll with that, without a windshield and everything? That wouldn't work. So <clears throat> he's most likely in a four-wheel chariot, which rich people had. When it, was, it wasn't for battle, it was for transportation. And it was more like what we call a coach. Right? And, um, you know, what Cinderella would ride or a stagecoach or something like that that's enclosed. And this official was rich enough that he was able to buy a hand-lettered scroll um, of the Greek translation of Isaiah. And scrolls were expensive, you know. You, they, until, until the time of Gutenberg, you know, nobody could afford Bibles. So he, was, he had this scroll himself. He probably bought it in Alexandria, where the Greek translation of the Old Testament had been done. And he was probably on his way back through Gaza to Alexandria to catch a boat to go down to uh, Meroe, his home city up the Nile. And the, so the spirit whispers to Philip, go up to that chariot. That's your target. That's why I told you to come down here to this road. Have you ever had the spirit nudge you to talk to somebody or walk up to them? I, I certainly have. It's kind of weird sometimes. You don't know why he wants you to, to go talk to that person. Um, I actually can, can think of two occasions when I just happened, you know, I just felt intuitively I should go to a certain place, and I met somebody there who literally asked me to baptize them, like people I didn't know, you know. It was the strangest thing. But that's kind of what happens here. Philip, here's this man, and he's reading uh, out loud in Greek. Now, I don't know if you knew that in ancient times, everybody read out loud, right? The silent reading didn't become common until at least the 10th century, you know? Everybody back then read out loud. The library was noisy, you know? Uh, and so Philip, outside the chariot, can hear what this guy is reading inside the chariot, and he recognizes it as part of Isaiah. And by golly, it's one of those verses about the suffering servant that Christians were already using in their preaching about the cross. And so he thinks to himself, no wonder the Spirit led me here. You know, I can't believe he is reading those verses. And Philip asks the official, do you understand what you're reading? And that's not because he thinks the African is ignorant. But the Philip knows it's not easy to understand Isaiah, and it would be impossible to know that it's talking about the Messiah without an interpreter. I think this is kind of one of the great evangelistic pickup lines. You, know, you see somebody reading a book, and you want to strike up a conversation with them, and you say, do you understand that book you're reading? Yeah. Or at least you could ask him, what do you think about that book? And get started that way. And that's what Philip does. Well, the African's not at all offended by this question. He says, how can I understand it unless somebody explains it to me? Preferably, of course, a Jew. Okay, it's their scripture. And so he invites Philip to get into the car. And they head down the highway, reading the scroll together. And the official asks a question, which scholars asked back then, and they still ask today. Is Isaiah talking about himself as a suffering servant, or is he talking about somebody else? And it's just such an opening for Philip, you know? And Philip is happy to tell him that the one that the prophet is talking about is actually a messiah who is going to come and suffer for the sins of his people. And that Messiah that Isaiah talked about has actually arrived. And he died and suffered. And 
he rose again, and his name is Jesus. And so Philip explains the whole story to him and what it means to become a Christian. And by God's design, like this whole incident, they come to a pool of water in what is a dry area. And the official says, hey, look, I mean, what are the odds? There's water right there. And he asks in the NRSV and in many translations, he asks the question, what is to prevent me from being baptized? The King James renders it, what is to hinder me to be baptized? I like that because I know the last word in the Gospel of Acts, the book of Acts, is hinder, unhindered, unhindered. Paul was proclaiming the gospel in Rome, unhindered. There's a great old commentary uh, written by a, a Southern Baptist scholar, Frank Stagg, a commentary on Acts that has the title, The Early Struggle for an Unhindered Gospel. And that's kind of the theme of the book of Acts. But I, I've been keeping something from you so far as I've told this story. The reason this official would ask, what is there that would prevent him from being baptized, is that he is a eunuch. And a eunuch is a man who's had his sex organs cut off. And it was pretty common that uh, a man who served a queen would be de-sexed, not necessarily voluntarily maybe even from childhood. I mean, most likely the eunuch had developed from birth without testosterone. And in many cultures, such a person is considered neither male nor female. You know? um, some cultures call it a third sex, um, the way we might call someone recently, we call them non-binary, right? And I've avoided re referring to him as a black man because people wouldn't have thought of him that way. I just kept the masculine pronouns in because that's what Axe does. And I think it would be too confusing if I changed it to they. I, not, I can't do that. But the eunuch may have already made a commitment to the Jewish faith in his heart, you know? After all, he's made a very long pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Even today, if you drove it by car, it's 39 hours. It's a long trip. And I don't know if he knew this when he left home, but he was never going to be allowed inside the temple in Jerusalem. There was a law. Deuteronomy 23.1 says, no one whose testicles have been crushed or whose penis has been cut off, shall be admitted to the temple. Now, I can't say that I know why there was such a law. And to be honest, I can't even tell you for sure that it was actually God's will, or it was some human standard that was based on a lawgiver's sense of disgust. But there were other laws saying that nobody physically imperfect was allowed into God's presence. That is, you couldn't come in if you were scarred or disfigured or crippled or blind or had leprosy or wounded or a lot. You had to be perfect to come in to God's presence. By those standards, the risen Christ would not have been allowed into the temple. And Jesus clearly did not believe in keeping those people out. I mean, those people who would have been excluded, they're the very people that Jesus reached out to in his ministry. And in those verses that we read from Isaiah 56, you can tell that even the prophet Isaiah didn't believe in such exclusion either. He hears the Lord saying that someday the Lord will bring eunuchs and foreigners into his temple. I mean, he basically says that even God didn't believe in that rule in Deuteronomy. He's going to change it and fix it and make it just. But here is our powerful official from Murray 
who has made this trip by boat and then coach to Jerusalem, I'm guessing 10 days maybe for that trip, and he bought himself Jewish scriptures to study, but when he got to the temple, he was turned away because he was imperfect. He was a eunuch. I mean, wouldn't that just break your heart? And one of the verses he was reading from Isaiah said, in his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. And he must have thought, yeah, that applies to me. There's a, a Lutheran woman pastor named uh, Nadia Boltz Weber who started a church called, uh, this is in Denver, a church called House for All Sinners and Saints. I love that name for a church. <laughs> yeah. And in her sermon on this story about the eunuch, she told a story about a guy in her church named Stuart. And usually Stuart came to church in blue jeans and what she called a grease monkey jacket. But this one Sunday, he showed up in church in slacks, a button-down collar shirt, and it was because he'd come from a baptismal service for a child of his friends at another church. A steward is gay, and his friends are straight. Uh, but they asked him to be the godfather and the baptismal sponsor for their young child. And to Stuart's surprise, uh, they had a little reception afterwards back at the, at the uh, house where these parents lived. And to Stuart's surprise, his friends got everybody's attention. Like, we want to say something here. And they want to say a few words about why they had chosen Stuart to be their child's godparent. We chose you, Stuart, they said, because for most of your life, you have pursued Christ and Christ's church. Even though as a gay man, all you've heard from the church is that there is no love for you here. And that kind of pursuit for God in spite of exclusion is what we see in the eunuch as well. The eunuch in Acts 8 stands for all the people who have been kept out of church because of gender issues or sexual orientation issues. And he asks, when he asks Philip, what is there to prevent me from being baptized? He's saying, you, you know what I am, right? Is my gender status going to keep me out of the church? And Philip, in most manuscripts of Acts, at least, he doesn't say anything to this question. He just goes down into the water with the eunuch and baptizes him. Enough said. That is the answer to the question. And Philip is carried away by the spirit to another preaching job, but the eunuch goes in his way rejoicing that he has been loved and forgiven and accepted. I'm a, a student in a graduate program at um, the University of Baltimore in creative writing. Three of my classmates that I've gotten to know there have changed their gender and their names in the last year. Right? Um, there may be others that I don't know, but these three I know fairly well. And <clears throat> some are transitioning with hormones. Um, they all list their pronouns after their name on their Zoom screen, you know, uh, which I have to kind of remind myself of because I knew them this way and now that way. Um, and I've been with them in memoir classes where they wrote about, uh, all three of them wrote about growing up in evangelical churches. And the churches were very um, important to them. And they went to youth camp you know, as teenagers. And they concluded by the time they got to adulthood that there was no room for gay or trans people in the church. 
And it, now it seems to me that just recently, we, we've started treating trans people as the new frontier in the culture wars. Um, Christians are supposed to stand up against anyone who doesn't feel all man or all woman and stay the way they were born. And we're actually, even evangelicals, we're actually more comfortable these days with gays and lesbians. We're kind of used to them and familiar to, with them. And I think the truth is most people know what same-sex attraction feels like. But not being clear about your gender is not something that we've experienced. Um, and the thought that a person might be neither M nor F uh, kind of freaks us out. Yeah? And I don't know if our, our judgment stems from disgust or from anxiety, but we don't know how to explain to ourselves even the existence of trans people or non-binary people or, or intersex people or third sex, third gender people like the eunuchs. The last time that I preached on Acts 8, you know the last time it came up in the lectionary and it was my turn to preach, was a few years ago. And I didn't know anything at that time about what we call non-binary people, right? The first time I really had to deal with it was when a male Baptist minister, friend of mine in Rhode Island, who grew up Southern Baptist like me, uh, he grew up Southern Baptist in Texas, he revealed to our pastor's fellowship one day that he was transitioning to being a woman. Yeah. And we had to, to figure out whether, you know, were we still going to be friends and colleagues? A church, amazingly enough, after he became a woman, a church called him as the woman pastor of their church. Uh, but other than that case, I have never heard anyone talk about these issues in church. But now, it feels to me like the story of Philip and the eunuch won't let us off the hook. Here's a story of a third gender person who has not been allowed in worship, but the spirit goes to great lengths to get the message of Jesus to him and get him baptized. What is to prevent the non-binary, the transitioning, the genderless from being baptized and coming into the church? Maybe the best answer is to be like Philip and say nothing. Say nothing. Do not explain. Do not judge. Just baptize them and welcome them into the church. It's something for you to think about. We're going to sing a song now about sharing his love, sharing God's love by telling everybody about Jesus. That is hymn number 567. This is going to serve as our hymn of preparation for the Lord's Supper as well. So if you're at home uh, and you don't already have uh, elements ready, I give you a chance during this hymn to go get a piece of bread or a cracker or whatever you can use and uh, some juice or wine or whatever you have at home uh, to get elements so you could celebrate the Lord's Supper together with those of us who are here in this sanctuary. Now let's sing together, 567, Share His Love.
We come now to time for the Lord's Supper. It is the Lord Jesus himself who invites us to this meal, and he invites all of you. Um, I think he invites those of you who have committed yourselves to Jesus and been baptized like the Ethiopian. I think he invites those who are seeking to believe in Jesus and need to come into fellowship with him. So we invite you, wherever you are, to uh, take your bread and your cup as we, the few that are here in the sanctuary, will be sharing this meal together. It was on the night that he was betrayed that Jesus gathered with his disciples in the upper room and they shared a meal together probably a Passover meal. And at the end of the meal, Jesus took the cup, uh, took the bread rather, and he said, this bread is my body that is being broken for you. And in the same manner, he took the cup. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant that is being ratified by my shed blood. Do this in remembrance of me. And so ever since that day, Christians have gathered to remember what Jesus did for us, that he bled and died for us, that he allowed his body to be broken and pierced, that he suffered for our transgressions, as Isaiah said, and that because by his wounds, we have been healed and forgiven. And so I invite you at this time, we'll invite those who are in the sanctuary to come forward to the table to receive the elements and you at home, um, be sure you have yours ready for the instructions to partake with us. I invite you to hold up your piece of bread to remember what it is and to partake with these words, this is my body, take, eat. Now lift up the cup and think of these words. Jesus said, drink it, all of you. Amen. Now it's our tradition to sing, blessed be the tie, to remember how we have been unified uh, as we've shared this meal together. So let's sing together uh, the first stanza of Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. Friends, we have been made one in Christ. We have met Christ in this place and in this meal. So go now 
as those who know they've been forgiven, who have received grace, who can live in hope and go to spread the good news of God's love for everyone and the possibility of redemption for all and God's desire to draw everyone into his kingdom. Amen.